Hopefully you have your Bibles with you, whether electronic or old school and best in my opinion, paper. And uh, so turn with us to Genesis, we are in chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, we've been talking about the creation for the last few weeks, and uh, we've been taking it slowly, at least through this first chapter, and uh, we will also take it slowly through the second and third chapter, because what is written at the beginning of the Bible here is uh, foundational um, for everything that we need to know about uh, Jesus Christ, for example, most importantly, but also about God himself, how he created all things, and uh, it is very, very important, it is fundamental to our theology that we understand Genesis and how God created all things. And so, uh, by way of review, let's see if we got this working here, Amy. Hey, there we go. Uh, anybody know what those two creatures are? Blue-footed boobies. Blue-footed boobies. Right. I mentioned that uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and just there's something about a blue-footed booby that just makes me laugh. The, the name, uh, the way that they look, the way that they behave, the way that they act. And um, today we're going to cover creation days five and six, which is uh, the time period where God created the blue-footed booby. And so I'm thankful for that creature. Maybe you have one in mind that, that you like that just really uh, makes you happy, whether it be horses or dogs or whatever. But for me, it's the blue-footed booby. Um, I don't know why. It just makes me laugh and smile every time I see it. So, uh, by, by way of review, um, the first day of creation, God separated the light from the darkness. As we know, there was uh, darkness, there was deep, and then God created light, and then he separated that light from the darkness. Day two, God separated the water from the sky. So at one point, there was so much humidity in, in every place, but God separated that. He created the, uh, the expanse, which is where we're in right now, the troposphere, and he gave us the waters above, which is the layer of clouds and humidity above, and waters below, which is uh, the seas. And at one point, for a very short period of time, we had a, a planet that was a water planet. But then day three came along, and then God separated the earth from the seas. He let there be land on this water planet. And he also created vegetation upon the land. And day four, God created the sun, moon, and the stars. If you remember, on day one, God created light, but he did not apply that light to any specific creation until day four. As uh, we learned last week, that's what we covered, um, we learned that God had vegetation, God had plants already growing, even without the sun, uh, the moon, or the stars. And so that tells us, that should tell us, that God is supreme, that God is sovereign, that, that even without those things that we think we need to live and survive, as long as we have God, we will live, we will survive, we will move, we will have our being. So God is the sustainer. Uh, as great as the sun and all those things are on a day-to-day -day basis, God is greater. That's the point. Day five, which we're going to cover today, God creates the sea creatures and the birds, such as the blue-footed booby. Day six, God creates the land creatures and human beings, and God gives the vegetation, which he's already created, as food for his creatures. And uh, before we get into days five and six, I wanted to offer an aid for you. Um, I know as often as I study this, as often as I have studied this throughout my life, that as time goes by, I tend to forget the sequence of events on the days of creation. You know, I, I can think to myself, I know he created light, I know he created the expanse and all that, but, but somewhere in my, my limited brain, I tend to forget what sequence that is, what order that is. And I wanted to offer for you a device that will hopefully help you in the way that it has helped me to remember those things. And uh, it's this. So, in this first category, we have days one, two, and three. So he created light, he divided the light in the dark, and he separated the waters from the sky, and he has the land, right? So in the first sequence of events, God lays the palette, he, he lays the foundation for life. 
Okay, at, at this point, other than, you know, technically the plants, I guess, um, he hasn't created life, he's just created a, a place for life. And then on days four, five, and six, you see how that works together? So if day one he created light, day four, he created uh, things in which light will be localized. The sun, the moon, and the stars. So he applied his light. See how that works? Day two, God created the waters. And day, day five, he created the creatures to inhabit the waters. And then day three, God uh, separated the, the earth from the sea, gave vegetation. And day six, God created uh, man and land animals to inhabit that. So if you, if you are a visual person like I am, this helps us to think of the sequence of events that God somehow layered it in two different ways in his creation. So anyway, uh, if you're interested in having a model of that, I'll make sure and put that um, online for us to have. But today we're going to talk about verses or, uh, days 5 and 6. Let's go to the scriptures. We're in Genesis chapter 1, verse 20. Which says, And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm, according to their kinds, and every winged bird, according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. So on the fifth day, we see that God created the great sea creatures. All the creatures in the waters, including the seas. And this includes the oceans, the lakes, the rivers, every creature that makes its home in the water, God created on the fifth day. We see here a division. We see that God created the uh, great sea creatures which uh, great here means great in size. It's not talking about uh, greatness in order or uh, privilege or anything like that. Simply great in size. So God created creatures in the sea, great and small. And the Leviathan, anybody uh, come across that word as you're reading through the Old Testament, especially Psalms? Leviathan, right? Um, the Leviathan is mentioned in the Bible and it would fit the category of the great sea creatures. Here's a couple places. Psalm 104, 25 and 26. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. There go the ships and the Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. We also see Psalm 148, 7. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all deeps. Finally, Job 41, 1 through 2. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? What is the largest creature that lives in the ocean? The blue whale, right. The blue whale. So either, uh, what, what's the name of that shark that they're, they're assuming wants the megalodon or something like that? They found a tooth about this big. Uh, like a shark tooth about that big, where the standard shark tooth is maybe about that big. And so they're assuming that at one point there was a shark that was like 20 times the size of a blue whale or something like that. Um, but we do know that God has created all the large creatures, even some of those which have gone extinct perhaps, and he created them in the sea. And he also created the small water creatures as well. The Census of Marine Life estimates that there are more than 230,000 kinds or species uh, in our oceans, and this is not including lakes. 230,000. But it is also believed that two-thirds of marine species remain unknown to us. So if that tells you anything. There are, uh, we've explored a lot of outer, outer space, but there's still a lot of uh, inner space here on Earth. The, uh, the depths of the ocean that we have not even traveled to yet, and there are certainly creatures that we continue to discover. And that just makes me think of how wonderful God is and how he created everything. And that uh, however many thousands of years since his creation, we are still discovering new creatures, new creatures in the sea, new creatures on land. 
So God is amazing. He is infinitely more wonderful than we could ever possibly think. And his uh, creative powers are more wonderful than we could ever possibly think. And so God also created flying creatures. Uh, the word, the Hebrew word, oh, which includes uh, all flying creatures is used here. Some translations, raise your hand if your translation says just birds. Okay, got a couple hands. How many of your translations say flying creatures? Okay, all right, so we, we have both. So which is it? Is it a bird or is it a flying creature? Well, we know that uh, the word ope has a much broader meaning than simply just birds. And we know this because, um, for example, Deuteronomy 14, 19 through 20, this is a, this is, I, I'd encourage you to turn your Bibles, put a bookmarker there, go back later and read it. I'm, I'm going to call upon this a little bit later as well. Uh, but this is God giving the Hebrew people a menu of food that they're allowed to eat and that the menu of food that they're not allowed to eat. And he goes through the lists of animals in, in a general sense. But in the bird section, when it comes to, you know, imagine opening your, your menu, you, you have your, your bird section, and the things that you can't eat and can't eat, well, insects are included in that part of the menu as, as something that you cannot eat. So that tells us that this word that is used for bird also must include um, insects that are flying as well. So, um, all winged insects are unclean for you. They shall not be eaten. All clean winged things you may eat. Deuteronomy 14, 19, 20. So that's one of the reasons that we know. Um, so, we can say that on the fifth day that God created the great and small sea creatures, and he created all the flying creatures, which includes the flying insects as well. So you have your flying birds, and just as marine life seems to fly across the waters, so God created the birds to fly and occupy the expanse, the space of expanse. Are you noticing a trend with how God created things? He doesn't want to leave anything empty or, or, or unfull. He, he wanted things, life, he wanted life to occupy uh, all different areas of his creation. So birds are that which occupy the expanse. Birds comprise nearly 10,000 living kinds or species, so not nearly as much as the water creatures. Winged insects, those are part of that as well. And there are currently 237 known flying insects in the world. How many of you love flying insects? <laughs> well, if you don't, let me remind you that God created them just as well. And when he was done creating them, he said they are good. So uh, they do have a purpose. However, the negative effects of these flying insects and flying creatures are, of course, due to the fall. So you can blame Satan. You can blame Adam uh, for that problem. But I guarantee you that in the end, when Christ returns in the day of the Lord, that he will expel all the negative aspects of those flying insects. Uh, praise the Lord. So, God created on the fifth day these things. Next, day six, land creatures. Verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God said that it was good. So let's begin here with the animals, the land animals. God, uh, the, the scriptures here list out three types of land animals. And the first type is livestock. This is your domestic animal. This is your uh, cow. This is your uh, dog, your cat, those which can be domesticated. And <clears throat> the next kind is he created uh, the creeping things, which the Hebrew word is remens, which refers to low-moving uh, ground creatures that seem to glide or slide. And in this category, you can include uh, the, the land insects, um, as well as reptiles and things of that nature. So he created that as part of the land animal. And also the beasts. These are the wild animals. These are the untamed 
creatures that are generally resistant to and unpredictable in a domestic situation. You've probably read stories or seen movies or whatnot of people trying to domesticate wild beasts. And typically or usually it doesn't turn out very well. Um, I remember watching a documentary on a lady who tried to own all these chimpanzees. And she tried to domesticate them herself. Uh, she got whatever permit she needed. So, but um, all the same, something came up. She was in the cage with them. She was feeding them or something, playing with them. And they turned on her. And uh, they just they beat her within an inch of her life. Same thing with, with bears. We've seen situations with bears where they just turn on their owners. And so God created domestic creatures. He created creeping creatures. He created wild creatures. And he created them to be distinct and different from each other for his purposes. And so when we read here and we see that God saw that it was good, the creatures that he created to fill the atmosphere, to fill the land and the sea, he said that it was good. And so that begs the question, what, in what ways are water, air, and land creatures good and useful? And you can tell which way I'm most thankful for. <laughs> <laughs> we have spent our entire existence as mankind discovering all the wonder of God's creation. Um, part of that wonder, most of that wonder, at least for me, exists in the creatures and the diversity of creatures and how they live and how they operate, uh, just all the wonders that goes into the creatures that God has created. And because of this, uh, I can only categorically tell you some of the benefits of, of how animals are good. I'm sure there's more, maybe you can think of them. And if you do think of them, I'd love to talk with you afterwards and, and hear what you might think. But categorically, here are some of the reasons why animals are good and useful. And uh, if, if you don't remember from the last few weeks, um, when we say good, when God said it was good, what he means is that it, it is useful. It has a purpose, a place, a function, and it is good. It, it, it functions in a way that is good. And so when we say good, we mean useful. And so one of those ways, I think filler, and as I mentioned before, that without creatures filling the sea, the land, and the air, it would be a pretty bland and boring environment, wouldn't it? Uh, it wouldn't feel like it was alive and moving and, and functioning. It would just simply be a, a canvas to look at. Canvases without uh, creatures or an object or a subject are pretty boring. We have spent our entire existence discovering all the wonderful varieties of animals that there are. Uh, has anybody made that their lifelong goal to discover every variety and type of animal? <laughs> Any bird watchers here? You got the little book and you got your binoculars by the window and you're out looking and, oh, what is that one? I've never seen that one before, right? It, it, it is fun to uh, explore and discover what God has created. And this has provided us with enjoyment. This has provided us with joy in our life. God has created creatures as one aspect of good to provide filler in our life. Excitement, joy of discovery, filler. Next, production. If you are a farmer, you obviously know the value of animals, not just in providing food, like when you're butchering chickens and such, but uh, also if you have oxen uh, to help you uh, tread the ground and everything. Uh, if you like to ride horses to get from point A to point B, if you fancy yourself a, a cowboy and, and you prefer to ride on horses uh, or a cowboy. And uh, so we see that for production, animals are good. Design, why did I say design? Where do you think we get a majority of the designs that we have for the mechanisms that we use? Especially when it comes to travel, animals. Uh, the, the helicopters, uh, planes, all those things that we enjoy are because we have used what God has given us with the animals. We've studied the animals, looked at how do they fly in that such a way, and we've tried to emulate that uh, with mechanisms, and we've done a fairly good job, and nothing can compete with how God has created the animals to move and to function. And so, for production, farm, travel, design, things that we use, 
those, that is one thing that is good about animals. And my favorite part of the animal is food. And though, this is interesting, though initially um, all creatures, including man, we only ate fruit and vegetation. So before the fall, there, there was no mention of uh, killing Porky Pig and eating his bacon. Um, simply, God said he provided the vegetation for the animals and for the man for man to eat. So, but before you start knocking on a vegetarian, uh, just remember that Adam and Eve, and in the very beginning, that um, they were vegetarian. And so, um, that has its place as well. Again, Deuteronomy, I'd encourage you to read that. Acts 10, 9 through 16, that talks of when uh, Peter had the vision of the sheep coming down and and had those uh, creatures on it, and God said, Peter, kill and eat, and I thank God for that verse in Acts, I thank God for bacon, and I thank God for <laughs> steak, and all the other meats, the meat pizzas, and everything that we got, um, and I, I also defer to the scripture, which says that, um, that even though all things are permissible, not all things are beneficial, so I understand the risks of eating bacon, I understand the risks of eating steak, and uh, I am still happy to do it. <laughs> Whenever I get a chance. <laughs> Another reason why animals are good is uh, they act as a metaphorical representation of theological truth. That sounds like a lot of mumbo jumbo, but here's what I mean by that. Uh, throughout the Bible, God uses animals and creatures and their behaviors as a metaphorical way to demonstrate his own nature, his own nature, and explain certain theological principles. So, for example, Isaiah 40, 30, many of you have heard this verse. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Um, God uses, in an artistic way, the function of animals to communicate a truth to us. So, those who wait on the Lord, you will fly, you will mount up with wings like eagles. Now, will we literally sprout wings and start flying like an eagle? No, but we get the idea because we're, we're getting the metaphor. We know what God is trying to say. And so God uses animals to communicate that truth to us. John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Obviously, God used the sacrificial system of Israel to paint a picture of what Jesus is like in redemptive history for us. Um, with the lambs and the goats and that which they used to sacrifice uh, for the atonement of sin, um, Jesus came to be the perfect sacrifice for all mankind. So now, therefore, there is no longer a need for um, any kind of priest and, and for bringing your animals uh, before a priest and to have them slaughtered for the atonement of sin and the demonstration of faith. No, now we have Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice for us, who died once and for all for our sins. And because of that imagery, because of the lamb imagery and the slaughter of the lamb, and because of John the Baptist beholding Jesus Christ coming in the distance saying, Behold the Lamb of God. We can understand that biblical truth of atonement, of sacrifice, of grace, of love, of the mercy of Jesus Christ. And so God uses animals to communicate to us. Also, Jesus, when he was approaching Jerusalem, if you remember, he wept over Jerusalem as he approached. And he says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you are not willing. So you see the picture, you, you get the idea that God uses animals not just as filler, not just as food, but he uses his creation, animals and, and other, to communicate his biblical truth to us. And so um, it was interesting, actually, as I was pulling up here to the church, uh, I was running through the sermon in my mind, I was just kind of rehearsing it silently to myself. And I came to the part where um, it was about the, the birds in the expanse. And as I walked up to the front doors, I looked up and I saw there were some geese that were heading south, flying overhead. There was five of them, I counted. 
And I, I just sat there and I just, just kind of smiled to myself. I just, you know, looked at the creatures and I just, it, it just maybe glorified God in that moment even more. Because here I'm thinking about how God created them and here they go. And, and how do they know the path in which to go? It's just a miracle to me how these birds, when they migrate, how do they know um, all the thousands of miles or whatever that they fly, how do they know where they're going? Especially when they're over the ocean. How do they know? God lets them know. God shows them the way. And so animals can be used to teach us about, about God. Finally, and most importantly, a reason why all these creatures are good is because they are a product of God's glory. They are a product of God's glory. And just as a building glorifies the architect and the skillful builders, so does the creation glorify our creator, our architect of, of all life, of all creatures. It glorifies it. I mean, do you ever walk up upon a painting or a building and you just think, wow, that's amazing. I wonder who built that. I wonder, I wonder who the builders were and all the hours of labor they put into it. What skill? Um, what wisdom? And then we look at the earth and we see just the complexity of life and just how deep it is. We, I think we've only just barely scratched the surface of how complex and amazing and wonderful life truly is. I mean, will there ever be an end to how much we can explore inner space? We go into the cell and then into all the different things, the mitochondria, and we go even deeper and deeper and deeper. Outer space, the, the expanse of outer space, will we ever um, truly explore that even in our lifetime? And it makes me think of the new heavens and the new earth, how um, there will thing, be things that are new. Uh, there may even be elements that are new. There may be uh, just different scientific functions that are, are brand new. Um, there are an infinite amount of possibilities with God when it comes to uh, creative things. And so as we look upon these things, as we see the birds that are migrating, as we uh, just look at the behaviors of the animals, it should cause us to come to a place of worship and adoration, just thinking, what a marvelous architect, what a skillful builder is our God. So they are products of his glory. It should cause us to come to a place just like Paul, who says, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. Place of worship. So if you can think of any other reasons why animals are good and useful, again, uh, brainstorm about that, and uh, I would love to hear what you have to say. Finally, to wrap up um, chapter 1, we're going to talk about God creating man. And I'm just going to look at this in a, uh, in a general sense. And next week when we come back, I want to put this uh, section under a microscope. There's just so much uh, theology here. There is so much we can expound upon. And I certainly, as much as I could, and I would definitely want to, uh, I don't want to keep you here for three or four hours. Um, I know we all have family to, uh, to visit. We have um, leisure time to have, a Sabbath, if you will. And so uh, we're just going to take a general look at this section. And then next week when we come back, we're going to take a closer look at all the different implications that are crammed into this section here. So verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw that everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. So here we see that God created mankind as well. Um, 
we tend to think that it needs to be more complicated than it's written, and we tend to need to know the answers of the how and the when all these things happen. Um, but I assure you that the more fruitful time we can spend is observing the, uh, the who and the why. And the who is that God created all things. God created animals, man, uh, earth, water, sky. God created all of that. And the why is so that we can glorify Him. And the why we will examine in more detail over the coming weeks as we look at this passage. So don't beat your head against the wall about the how or the when. Um, it's not a heresy, however, if you want to develop hypothesis as to maybe how God uh, did things or when God did things. But ultimately, it's not that important. It's really not that important. I, I don't think we're going to find that out with any uh, certainty before uh, the Lord returns. So focus more on the who, on the God. God is the creator. Worship him. On the why. We are his creatures um, intended to observe his creation and to worship him as a reason. Who and the why are the most important. So God made man uh, in his image and in his likeness. The Hebrew word for man is Adam. What, what's the Hebrew word for man? Adam. <laughs> you bear the name of a man. And if you know Adam Gill, you know he represents the man very well. He's a man's man. He's a man. You know? Adam. Um, to be made in the likeness and image of God essentially means that he shared with us his communicable attributes, such as his li the life, personality, truth, wisdom, love, holiness, Justice, creativity, emotion, you name it. There's many attributes of God you can think of. God has communicated those attributes with us. When you think about the animal kingdom, God definitely shares some of his attributes with the animals. For example, when we talk about uh, like the, the strength of God, God will use animals sometimes to express that imagery. But as far as expressing a, a, or giving a majority of his communicable, communicable attributes with us, um, humans, mankind, are unique in that aspect. And because of that, that allows us to have the capacity to have spiritual fellowship with God. So God created us, here's another uh, why, God created us to have fellowship with Him. Not that God needed to do that to be complete in any kind of way. Not that God needed that to be happy in any kind of way. He simply did it out of his own pleasure, out of his own will. Uh, he did it for his own glory. He created us so that we can have fellowship and have a relationship with him. And God has clearly and purposefully set mankind apart from all other creatures. So in that sense, mankind is holy. We are set apart from all other creatures. We are greater than the animals. We are greater than the plants. We are greater than the planet. God created us that way. He created us in his image for that reason. And this cannot be said about any other creature. God did not create any other creature in his own image after his likeness in the way that he created mankind. Uh, and I submit to you that even the angels were not created in that way. How do we know that? Now let's look at the, the scripture. Um, here's Cain and Abel. Uh, Genesis 9-6, whoever sheds the blood of man by man, his blood uh, be shed, for God made man in his own image. And so, why is this said about mankind, murder? Why is it murder when we kill one another, but not murder when we, let's say, shoot that perfect, uh, what, 12-point buck? Right? Why is that not murder? It's because bucks were not made in the image of God. Man was made in the image of God. So whenever we destroy a man, uh, we are destroying the image of God. Whenever we curse another man, we are cursing the image of God. But as far as killing bucks, do it. You can. <laughs> That's not murder. Secondly, angels, the reason why we are created greater than angels, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 3. Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertain to this life? So we are to judge angels. Angels do not judge us. God has put us in a position um, of judge. 
And that's something, that's an authority he has given to us because we are created in his image. And so it's very crucial, I think it's important to understand that distinction. Um, whenever you think about the importance of animals and man and all that, um, God on purpose made us to be set apart. God gave mankind dominion over plants and over creatures. It says, let them have domain, which uh, in its most literal sense means to trample over. And that sounds pretty harsh, it sounds violent even, um, but the point is that God has given man the ability and the role and the position to have the authority over uh, creatures, even violently if necessary. God has given man that ability. And before creation was corrupted through sin, man was given sovereignty over all creatures and all creation. But after sin entered in, the heavens and the earth became corrupted, unstable, and even chaotic. Um, that's why Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. That's why it's, it's understood that um, the world is in is Satan's domain, domain at this point, because we have basically forfeited that through our decision to sin against God. And so in the new heavens and the new earth, we can expect that that same domain uh, domination will exist. Finally, in closing, God decided to bless creatures, and this involves animals as well as man. And the Hebrew word for bless is barak, which the most basic understanding I can give you of what it means to be blessed is to be in a position of favor with God. Blessing is not receiving everything that you want, all the riches of life, all the health, the wealth, and the prosperity that you can ever have. That is not to be blessed in the most general sense. To be blessed is in, to be in a right relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. That is what it means to be blessed. Which means that whether you're going through a Job-like trial or anything else, if you are right with God, then my friends, you are blessed where you're at, position. That's what that means. Um, sometimes we can think, you know, God bless us on this day. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are blessed already. And if you are talking specifically about, Lord, pour out your blessings that, that I might feel like I am blessed, maybe that's slightly different. But we need to make a distinction between the two. Make no mistake, if you are a child of God, if you believe in Jesus Christ for eternal life, you are blessed right where you are. Because that means that on your last hour and your final breath, that he is going to take you home. Because you are blessed, you are in the right relationship with him. Let me put it in human terms or human thinking. Um, relationships. Relationships. We all have good relationships, and we all have bad relationships. When you think about somebody you're in a good relationship with, if you see them pulling up into your driveway, you look out the window, you see who they are, and if you're in a good relationship with them, you, your heart gets warm, you think, oh, good, I wonder why they're here. You, you feel happy about that. Or if you run into them at the, at the marketplace, you know, you, you see them from afar, and you're in a good relationship, so you want to go over and say hello, because it blesses you to be in that kind of relationship. Then you have the, uh, the bad relationships, the ones where when they pull down the driveway, they're like, oh, if I pull the blinds down, turn the lights off, they won't come home. <laughs> you see them, you know, come up on your phone, oh, ignore, right? Or if uh, you're in the marketplace, you see them from afar, and you're like, I'm going to go hide so they don't see me. That kind of thing. So in human terms, in a human relationship, when we think about being blessed with God, that means that he, when he blesses us, that means that he wants to be in our company. He wants to be with us. He wants us to be with him. But if you are in a cursed position, for example, then that's when he doesn't want you near. He doesn't want you around. Um, that's why when we think of eternity, we think of those who have eternal life and those who are eternally condemned. Those who are eternally condemned are cursed. They are not blessed. And they are not welcome in the fellowship community and the nearness of God. And those who are blessed will spend eternity with God uh, in that fellowship. 
So in this sense, God blessed all the creatures. Everything was satisfactory. Everything was fine. When he saw the blue-footed booby, when he saw the bear, when he saw the blue whale, when he saw man and woman walking about, he was perfectly happy. He didn't uh, push them away. He didn't make them go high. You think about when, in, uh, when man fell. Uh, what did man do as soon as he fell? He hid. He hid away. Right? There's something there that we need to know. So if you're, what I used to tell the youth all the time, is if you feel like you're in a situation where just the relationship isn't quite right with the Lord, it's not, you're not feeling that warm, fuzzy, you know, when you, when you come to church, or when you're, when you're on your knees praying, or when you're reading the Bible, or singing songs of worship, um, think about what you're doing in your life. Think about your behaviors. Think about, are, are you involved in some kind of a, a reoccurring, practicing sin? Are you in denial of your sin? Because if that's the case, then God's going to put a little distance between you and himself. Uh, he's he's going to, in a sense, almost maybe turn your back on him until you come and, re and repent. And so, to be in a blessed relationship positionally with God, uh, there's nothing greater. But there are uh, specific blessings that God gives, and in this case, Part of that blessing is uh, to reproduce. Reproduce the plants, the animals, uh, mankind. God bless them and let them reproduce. So generally speaking, by and large, and for the most part, Carter. Um, <laughs> I, I say that because he, he laughed at me last time I used that sequence. By and large, for the most part. Anyway, it's okay. um, God has blessed mankind, has blessed creatures with the ability to reproduce. And what a great thing that is. And let me offer comfort to you if uh, perhaps you are barren. Um, just because that is a general truth doesn't necessarily mean if you're a barren and can't have children that you are cursed. It's not necessarily what it means. You think about Job. Job was blessed, but boy, he lost a lot. He suffered a lot. Does that mean he wasn't blessed? No, it just means that God had a specific and very special plan for Job. And if you are barren, you can't have children, um, but God has a very specific and special plan for you uh, if you are his child. Perhaps um, even, even like Job, the, the glory of Job is the fact that he is in the scriptures. He, he made the cut. He is in the scriptures. We read about, we, we use the story of Job to bless our lives. He's a, a blessing to us. So bottom line, God created all creatures of all kinds to be good and useful in a variety of ways. And though everything God created was considered to be good, it was not considered to be very good until God created man and gave man dominion over all of it. So as you go about your day, as you think about the distinction between us and animals, just remember the importance. Remember the order and the structure in which God created all things. And as you do that, Give him glory, worship him, glorify him, because he is the perfect creator. Worship him for his son, Jesus Christ, who was sent as the lamb for you, for your sin, to cover your sin. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for communicating to us the truth of your creation. You told us on all these days how you made the, the earth and the world and the creatures all around us to be made. And you did it on purpose, you did it for a reason. And Father, I acknowledge the fact that you are God, that you are the creator. And I just pray, Lord, that you would help us to focus in on the who, which is you, and the why, which is to give you glory. Help us, Lord, not to become distracted by the, the when and the how, because, Father, you didn't tell us. You didn't tell us in great detail the, the when and the how. So Father, help us focus on that which we know, and not get tripped up by that which we cannot know. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb. And we just pray, Lord, that as we leave here, we will know for a fact that we are blessed if we believe in you, no matter what might come our way. Because if we're a child of you, we are in a right, we're in a right relationship, and for that we are thankful. In Jesus' name we pray.